Okay. Start player versus player. Loading the game pin. Okay, there's the game pin. And you'll have to forgive if I have typos. I always do these fast and then I don't tend to read them over it very good. And there's always something funny that I wrote that I didn't mean to. <laughs> what, me? I'm not in there. Somebody's. <laughs> Tired, tired and bitter. Oh. What time do you go to? 10.50? Um, I believe so. yes. Okay, yes. I, this should be, we should be done before this. This is just 30 questions, so. I feel like sometimes people get kicked out of this. Do you guys have that happen? You get, it just kicks you out. It'll keep you in the game. Okay, is that it? Okay. Okay, 23. Oh, someone's still coming. Okay, national board review questions for radiology. Some of these pictures hopefully aren't too small. Hopefully you can see them. Oh, okay. The decision to expose vertical bite wings over horizontal bite wings is based on TMJ pain, client's age, extent of calculus accumulation, paradox disease status. You're like, what kind of a board question is that? That's so easy, right? I hope so. I hope you, I hope you think that. Good. Well, that really was. That really wasn't one of the review. Um, it was like it was. It was more of a case study, but it was basically that question. So, yeah. I have to move this. I can't see my next button. We don't know who that is. Okay. What landmark are the arrows pointing to? Here's the air. I know this is hard to see. Here's the arrows. <laughs> what landmark are the arrows going to? Is that right? Maxillary tuberosity. So metro retromolar pads on the mandible. And then maxillary sinus, maybe that was someone that misprint, but um, that would be in a little bit farther. That was pointing to the very end. What are the two blue arrows pointing to in this piano? Did everyone answer? 20, good, hard palate. Yep, so the soft palate is a little bit more off to the side and it's a little bit um, lighter gray and it kind of comes off to the side on both sides. And then the hard palate, a lot of times you get the double, like a, um, a double real image of the hard palate. So you get like the real one and then you get a shadow of the palate above it. Um, and then the palatal glossal space is in the same area, but it's gonna be radiolucent.
What class of carries is visible on the distal of 13? Distal of 13. And I know these are hard to see, especially on the projector. Three, good job, yep. So it's a class three. So it was into the dentin, but not 50% or more. If it's more than 50% into the dentin, um, toward the pulp, then, um, then it's a class four. Class two would be it hasn't gotten into the dentin at all yet. It's still in the enamel. Class one and two are in the, in the enamel. Okay, good job. <laughs> What's the radiolucent band that the arrow is pointing to? So there's a kind of a radiolucent band right around this tooth here. I know it's a small picture. Carries cervical abrasion, cervical burnout. It's, oh, that was a tricky one. So it would have, you guys probably would have um, been able to see it better it, up close. That was a hard picture to look at. But some of the clues between cervical burnout and cervical abrasion, it was a band that went all the way from mesial to distal. So it went all the way across. So that means that it's ditched out all the way and it's thinned out. So if something's thinner, it's going to be more radiolucent. It's going to, you're going to see through it better. But cervical burnout, usually the bone level is totally normal, totally healthy, like the up here. And then you see a little shadow coming in on either side. And that's from those um, concavities or like the little fluting on the sides of the roots. So that was so that was a tricky one. So the cervical abrasion, it went all the way across, and you could see the. Wish I could go back to it. Huh. Oh well. I, oh, show media. Yeah. See how it comes all the way across, right through here. So the cervical burnout, it looks more like here and here, but this goes all the way across. Good to know. Good to know. What is the anomaly in this radiograph? Fusion or gemination, that's one of those. And I, I always get this mixed up still, it drives me crazy. So gemination, good job, you guys. So you count the teeth, remember? Um, if there's too few teeth, if there's too few teeth, it's fusion, if two teeth have fused together. If there's too many teeth, or it looks like there's too many teeth, it's gemination. Good job. Which of the following would improve the diagnostic quality of this right premolar? Um, so this one's kind of in the middle, so I've decided to call it a premolar. So in order to improve the diagnostic quality, of this premolar, what would you do? Yep, you're gonna ship the sensor mesially to pick up the canine because you can't see the distal of the canine. If you just move your BID or your PID, whatever we call it, you're just gonna cone cut. But if you move your sensor, and then of course you'll also adjust your BID accordingly, but what's gonna pick up the tooth is your sensor. The large radiolucency image near the apices of the maxillary molars and premolars um, is most likely what? So the large radiolucent area above the teeth. What do we call that? Yeah, maxillary sinus, good job. What is the term for electromagnetic radiation with sufficient energy to remove an orbital electron from the atom? I know, that's like... It, it, Yes, good. It's, I mean, the question was like, ah, la, la, but the answer is like, oh, yeah, yeah, it'd be ionizing radiation. So, 
if it was reversed, it said if it said define ionizing radiation, we'd all probably be screwed. But yeah. since it's <laughs> since it says, since it says the reverse, we can figure it out. The following are characteristics of radiation, except I have a feeling this is going to be a hot button for the national board because I've seen this in several review. So the I following, except this is an except. So which of these is basically not a characteristic of uh, radiation? Right, good. So it has no mass and no charge. So that's that's the um, electromagnetic radiation or the type we use, no mass, no charge. Um, that's and so that could easily be something they throw in. Everything else it moves in waves, it moves at the speed of light, um, it's invisible and um, produces biologic changes. It does do that. We know it does that. So, but it does not have particulate radiation, does have mass and charge, but electromagnetic does not. True false. Wavelengths determine the energy and penetrating power of the radiation. So depending on if your wavelengths are long or short, does it determine the energy? True. Yeah. So if you have long wavelengths, um, long and lazy, if you have short, they're um, more intense and they move, they penetrate more. Now the true or false. The longer the wavelengths, the greater the strength and penetrating power. True or false? <laughs> false, yeah. So long ones are weaker, short ones are more intense and stronger and penetrate more. All of the following are components of the tube head except one. Which one is the exception? So every all of these are in the tube head except which one? So there's no radioactive material. And uh, so when we think of radioactive material, we think of like nuclear fission and things like that, but our, um, but not, so there's nothing like that inside. There's the electrons and there's the cathode and the anode and there's that stuff happening, but there's no radioactive material. What percent of the kinetic energy inside the tube is actually converted to X-ray? Okay, it's 1% and then the other 99%, you guys remember what that is? Heat. Yeah, heat. So 1% becomes uh, electron photons and then the rest becomes just heat. <coughs> high, a high speed electron dislo dislodges an inner shell electron causing rearrangement of those shells starting from the outside to fill in the vacancy. So the electron is dislodged from the inside closest to the nucleus, and then they're rearranged. So what's, what is that? What kind of radiation is that? That's a hard one, I know. These, this takes a while to remember. So just remember with the Bremstrahlung, <laughs> Y'all thought it was the opposite. It's okay. So just remember with the Bremstrahlung, it gets close and veers off and it's that, it causes lots of different variations of wavelengths because it doesn't like impact something, sending it flying. And then it's that rearrangement of the electrons that causes the X-ray photon 
So that's the difference with characteristic, it impacts it. With Bremsstrahlung, it kind of um, gets close. And so it can be different. It can be short wavelengths, long wavelengths. It can be different wavelengths. Okay, which of the following terms refers to radiation that's deflected in all directions by the client's tissue? Bless you. Scatter, yep. So when the um, primary beam comes and hits the patient, it automatically some scatter happens. So you get that for a certain percent, another percentage gets absorbed, some of it just flies right through and hits the sensor. So lots of different things happen, but the part, what gets deflected is called scatter. The amount of electrons released during thermionic emission affects the number of X-ray photons produced, true or false. So there's electrons boiling off the um, coil. And it, if the number of those are increased, does that mean you'll have more x-ray photons? Did I say filter? I meant filament. I don't know what I said. True. It is true. So the more electrons you have on the filament, I don't know if I said filament the first time, but that's what I meant. Um, then you have more electrons available to make X-ray photons once they sail across and hit the other side and um, hit the little focal spot and become X-rays. <laughs> Kilovoltage controls the accelerating potential or the speed of electrons, true or false? Kilovoltage affects the speed. True. Yep. So the kilovoltage, in, um, it affects the speed and the amount of uh, kind of the penetrating power. And so it, it, it actually ends up controlling quality, but inversely, it also does quantity because if they're flying across faster, therefore you'll by default have more electric, uh, electron, um, x-ray photons, sorry. So kilovoltage kind of does both. MA only does quantity because it's only um, affecting the electron. Changing the milliamperage alters the wavelength of the X-ray. Does milliamperage do anything to wavelength? False. Yeah, so it only does the quantity of the electrons and the KVP um, is going to have an effect on the wavelength because that's the penetrating power. Which of the following, um, I guess we say BID, I don't ever remember, BID or PID length produces an X-ray beam that's less divergent. So meaning <laughs> we think of divergence kind of think of like the way it spreads out. So which length do we want basically a shorter PID to, for less spread or a longer one for less spread? <laughs> oh, look, you guys were like on the... And some people in the middle. Yeah, so if it's shorter, the beam's going to come out and spread faster, far, you know, more, it'll be more divergent right out the gate, as opposed to if they travel down a long tube, it kind of like keeps them in line. And then as they come in, they stay tighter. And 
um, they're not going to diverge as much. So a longer, so really you want a longer tube than a shorter tube. With, uh, with all other factors remaining constant, a decrease in exposure time will do what? If you just decrease, so think about when you're in, in there and you have a patient and you just hit the anterior button instead of the posterior button or something. So you've decreased the exposure time when you do that. Um, so if all things remain equal, what will that result? Good, yeah, decreased density. So say you're taking a maxillary molar, a mandibular molar, and you do and you decrease the exposure time, you're just giving less um, opportunity for x-ray exposure. And so you're gonna have um, a lighter picture, less density, a lighter picture. The effect of radiation damage to cells that occurs through the radio lysis of water is called what? So radiolysis is what kind of radiation damage? Indirect, so remember direct is when the um, X-ray photon comes in and like goes right into like the chemicals of life. Remember we call them the chemicals of life. So DNA, RNA, and it like goes right in and does a direct hit and so damages the cell like that. But if radiolysis happens, which happens far more often because we have more other stuff in our cells, the nucleus is really small, then it's indirect. You get damage to the cell. It starts to, you get the minus and the add addition of electrons. And a lot of times we get like hydrogen peroxide or some other kind of toxin that causes cell damage. So you still get cell damage, it's just indirect. It happens with a couple extra steps as opposed to going right in and hitting the DNA. Salty is doing very good, whoever that is. A child who presents with active decay or who is high risk could be assessed for bite wings every what? So if they have active decay or they're high risk, how often could they have x-rays? Yep, six to 12 months. Yep, so some, do some doctors will do bite wings every six months if the um, patient is constantly having decay. Um, or they might, like if they had active decay and they come back six months later, they might do it again. And then if they don't have any more active decay, then they might wait. Um, but sometimes they also base it on like how much plaque is in the mouth. They're like, this kid's had decay. They always have plaque. We're doing six months, every six months for them until they get you know healthier. So they just play it by ear, but they can take them. Um, it is ethical to do it every six months if they're high risk and have active decay especially. Which one of the following tissues is most radiosensitive? What's the most radiosensitive? Reproductive. So just think of anything that multiplies quickly um, is going to be more radio sensitive. Yeah. That it's muscle tissue doesn't tend um, because a lot of times when we are adults, we tend to be more stable with our bones and our muscles and our nerves and things like that. So if you think of anything that kind of stays and doesn't do a lot of changing, I mean, obviously we can 
there is turnover, but it turns over slowly. Whereas reproductive or um, what's inside your bone marrows or um, white blood cells, anything that is rapidly turning over is gonna be more radiosensitive. Young children are different, but children are gonna, um, you know, they're growing. So children, you have to consider a little different than adults. Which of the following is responsible for recording the image on a radiograph film? So this is probably, who knows if they're gonna ask you anything about traditional film, but if they do, what part of the traditional film actually records the image? <laughs> good good job yeah so it's the silver halide crystals that's where your latent image is and then when you develop it those crystals change to light and dark or get washed away if it's a radio opaque area so good, good job guys remembering that because that's not very relevant. We don't use those very often. Um, oops. Di okay, bisecting yields an image with minimum distortion. Do we tend to get more or less distortion with a bisecting technique? <laughs> well, so um, the paralleling technique will give us the least amount of distortion, but sometimes it's not as comfortable to the patient. So then we have to just make do and get it in there any which angle. But a lot of times we increase elongation and foreshortening because it's not parallel to the tooth always. We try to get it, um, if whatever angle it is, we take that bisector and we go perpendicular to the imaginary bisecting line, but that's, it's hard to do that. And so a lot of times we end up with more distortion. So it is not, it does not yield one with minimum distortion. It tends to have more distortion than the paralleling. Oh, that's weird. <laughs> that's, I'm doing so good. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, the bisecting technique increases client comfort during sensor placement. Yeah, true. So sometimes, like, you know, like when the sensor is really angled up or when it kind of falls a little bit more farther down than you think it's going to, usually we're adjusting those things because it's just easier for the patient to get it in their mouth. And then sometimes we have to just abandon that altogether and use a uh, snap array or something just so that the patient can tolerate it. So it do, they do tend to be more comfortable. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not always uncomfortable. It kind of depends on the patient's mouth. But in general, in general, the bisecting, we tend to go to bisecting because we can just get it in there however we can get it in there, but it'll have more, it'll have more um, distortion. The word went away from me. And so, yeah, so paralleling, because we, our main objective is to parallel the film with the tooth. So sometimes that's, it's ideal, but it's not comfortable. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically, yeah, because you're using, you just have the film there and then you have your, um, 
Mm -hmm. There's not really a grade. Although I'm thinking, so I made a video. I made a video for you guys. Holly will show it. It's not the best because I was kind of holding my cell phone and trying to demonstrate it. Hopefully, but so when I do the angles for the, um, when I do the angles for the occlusal films, I'm not necessarily thinking about getting perpendicular to, so maybe actually I want to actually say, maybe I want to draw that back because I'm not necessarily looking for the imaginary bisector and then coming in perpendicular. I'm more concerned with covering the space. I'm, usually it's about 45 to 60 degree angle. Sometimes it's steeper, like 60 degree angle. And I just want to make sure that my BID and the, the beam that comes out is going to cover the space of that flat film. So, yeah, or you can also think about it like, and, and I don't know how often you guys have used these in practice in clinic, but you can think about using the snap array and how um, when we did it in the anterior region, and so we got the film up against the tooth, and then we had to imagine that halfway line. And then so that oh, it's almost a little bit better with the snap ray because you can actually see the two angles. You see the tooth and you see your film, and then you have to imagine a, a halfway point. It's a hard, the bisecting is, is always been a hard thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you are right. Because, yeah, you're talking about your film flat. Yeah. Yeah. Halfway between the film and then your teeth. So there's this, and then you your BID comes in halfway. I'm going to have to go in and look at it. But I do think you are right. I think you're onto something there. And that might help, like you said, yeah, if it I'm helps like, visualize it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Visualize it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Which image would be the best projection for seeing the relative buccal lingual position of an impacted tooth? So you're trying to see if the tooth is like more, you know, like more buccally or lingually birded. So which kind of an image? And this is a little tricky, so we can talk about it after, but which kind of an image would let you see sort of top down from a tooth or underneath? So I know that was a tricky one. So the reason it's occlusal is because if you take any kind of a film like bite wings or PAs, you're come, you have your tooth here and you're coming in, generally speaking, at you know, some kind of an angle like this. So you're looking more from like, you're looking at it more buccally lingually, but you want to see the position of it buccal and lingual. So in order to see that, you have to look either from above or below. And the only film that does that is an occlusal. I know that was probably way out of The arch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is we didn't really talk about that that much. I don't think when we did radiology last year. So that is you'll it would be a clusal, you'll see your arch, and then you can see how things are kind of buckly lingually oriented. And then when you take your PAs or your bite wings. You're just coming through, so you're you're looking at it from the side, so that doesn't show where it's located. This is very visual. I need pictures. I don't probably am not describing it very good. Okay, true or false? Elongation error um, results from inadequate vertical angulation. So if you are not vertically angulated enough, but and you're too flat, is that what causes elongation?
True, yep. So elongation, so I always think about when the sun rises and as this, when the sun is low on the horizon, the shadows are long. When the, as the sun comes up in the sky, the shadows shorten. So if you think about like the shadow of a tree or something like that, when the, when the sun's on the horizon low, that tree's gonna be long. And then as it goes up into the sky, it foreshortens or the shadow shortens and gets closer to the base of the tree. Yeah. Widening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Whatever. I know. So you just kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, Elon, like thinking. Right. Is vertical. Yeah. You just have to get. Kind of, uh, I always say, tell yourself a story of, you know, like tell yourself now, all of those kind of study, study clues. Um, but yeah, if your BID is flat, then you're going to elongate your picture. And so that's what we do if we can't see the roots. If we have like, this thing has such long roots, get steeper or, you know, either come up steeper or come down steeper to shorten it. So that's what you do to see, to try and squish down the roots a little bit, hopefully, and get the roots on the, on the picture. Okay, last one, overlapping proximal contacts results from excessive vertical angulation. <clears throat> False, right? Vertical angulation has nothing to do with contact. It's all horizontal, right? Side to side. So good, you guys did really good overall. So I would, I the PowerPoint that's in there. Um, oh, let's see who won. Okay. Hopefully it, not my name. <laughs> that would be Cupid, Brad, and I won. How did that happen? Who's Leslie? Congratulations, whoever you are, Leslie. Um, okay, you guys did really good, all of you. And so um, the PowerPoint that's in there. It literally, I took one of the review books and I just was like pulling stuff that they highlighted as like key things. Um, there's also some review on piano anatomy um, and a couple other things. I can also post, there's cahoots that we I made for um, like landmarks and stuff like that. If you want me to just post them in there, um, you, can, you can go into those again. So there's lots of, there's lots of resources and I know you guys aren't really into the place where you want to like hardcore double down on studying radiology, but it's in there um, for your for your review. So definitely at least go through and try the Moodle um, quiz, but you can take that as many times as you want. And you guys are all set. Have a great rest of your day. You're welcome. <laughs>